Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. 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 I hope you enjoy. Story number one. No pain, no gain. Written by Thrandom 3 x Threskill, kept low as bolts of highly concentrated ultraviolet light, popped and whizzed overhead. He'd signed up to serve in the military a few years back, and one of the many things he had gained from the experience was regret. See the galaxy, serve and protect. So many slogans. And he had bought them hook, line, sinker. But all he did was stand around, twiddling his claws or have to deal with the rightfully protesting civilians. He had constantly wished for something interesting to happen. A battle, at least. Bait, though, seemed to have a sense of humor as two days before his term of volunteer service was meant to come to an end. War was declared. An emergency conscription order was issued, and all serving races had their terms extended till the end of the conflict. At first, Thurskull felt nothing but anticipation. Finally, a fight that he can dig his fangs into. Oh, how arrogant he was. He often hoped for a temporal anomaly to send him back so that he could stop his idiot younger self from signing up. His musings was interrupted by the scrambling form that dropped into the foxhole that he was lying in. He was a human. Amongst the races serving in the Allied System's military, the humans were the most laughable. Physically weak and barely sentient by some of the more intelligent races' standards, nothing at all unique nor interesting about them. Looking over at the human's face, he balked. The human was showing a threat display. He had to pause a moment to remember human showing its fangs meant that they were experiencing positive emotions. So we're going to take their position, sir? The human asked with a tilt of his head. Are you mad, human? Preskill cried out. Any rays hit by those bolts will get burnt away rapidly. Well, uh, sitting here isn't going to do us much good. The human shouted back. His sentence was punctuated by a mortar shell landing nearby. We're under heavy fire. Human or you haven't noticed. Preskill roared, his temper starting to run short. Uh, no pain, no gain, the human said with a shrug. You can sit there, sir. I'll charge the line. The human shouted as he darted up and over the ridge and screamed a battle cry. Dreskel was paralyzed by what he had seen. The human must have been an insane one sent forwards to absorb fire while the actually sane warriors followed. Humans must be despicable indeed. Slowly, but surely, the cracks of bolts began to quieten. Cautiously, Dreskel poked his head over the ridge and was stunned to see the smoldering emplacement moving up and keeping low as he approached, he readied his carbonizer rifle. Drop your weapons. If you surrender now, I will guarantee your lives under the Intergalactic Treaty of Paris, Threskel shouted as he aimed at the dugout that was filled with corpses. In the middle stood the human. It took all of his effort not to puke up his meal from earlier. Standing in the middle was a near dozen bolts wounds was the human. Uh, uh, hello, sir. He saluted and stood upright. We must get you to the medivac, Dreskel shouted in a panic. Huh? Sir, these little burns aren't going to do much. Can't even feel them, the human said, bearing its fangs again. Can't feel them, Dreskel repeated in shock. Adrenaline is really pumping right now. Could probably get my emplacements taken down up to a baker's dozen if I get one or more in, he replied with a shrug. You have taken down twelve emplacements already, Threskel asked in a growing terror. I sir, a little sunburn ain't killed anybody, the human paused. Well, ain't nobody I know of at least, he quickly added. Sunburn, Threskel repeated. I sir, the little flashlights down break our skin. It seems that we are rather tough bastards, he replied bashfully. Still, I must be off sir, me and my buddy are, are having a competition to see who can bank the most positions, the human said bearing his fangs again. Bzzzt. Hey, Mike, I just took on a heavy light cannon and got a killer tan. Also, I'm an eleven. A voice of his comm unit announced. You're up. Sorry, sir. I gotta go maintain my lead while I got it. The human said with a hasty salute as he turned and ran off. Wait, human, do your wounds seriously not hurt? Dreskel asked. A little, but adrenaline is keeping it too barely noticeable. Regardless, as I said... No pain, no gain, 
He saluted one more time before running off into the distance. Thresco collapsed against the sandbags in shock. These humans were terrifying. They didn't care about injury. They seemed to have excellent resistance to UV rifles. Maybe me had misjudged them. Thinking about it, with this insane race on their side, they might be home by Glipmus, as the government said. The last thing he heard before settling in for the long haul was the boom of the artillery starting up. End of story. Story number two. Immortality written by Echoing Cascade. Death was curious about finding a body, something of a novelty given his profession. A man had entered an extremely remote location and seemingly died alone. Meeting someone stuck in a nearly impossible place to get to wasn't exactly new for death. In fact, he was often expected to show up there sooner or later. But there is the remote, and then there is this. Jonathan Fry, the richest man in the known galaxy, had entered the heart of a white dwarf star and had ceased to exist. Not, not to die, ceased to exist. This I gotta see. Death entered the star and was surprised to find a rather large room inside it, and sitting in front of him was Jonathan Fry, with a small corky in his arms. I've been expecting you. We need to talk. Death sighed. This wasn't the first time someone had laid a trap for him. He made the move towards the man, but found himself unable to do so. Every time he moved so much, as a bone, his entire body splits into multiple images that would eventually coalesce back into the middle of the room. What is this? You are in a probability prison. A nexus of reality and unreality. The second you entered this room, the chances of death as a concept plummeted to zero. The only thing keeping you alive is the fact that I am looking at you. Death was speechless. He was quite literally one blink away from, well, dying. Do you understand the ramifications of your actions? Love floating reality into jeopardy, risking the unraveling of causality, dooming existence as we know it, yes? My immortality. Death had seen this coming. What is the dream of those who have everything to have all the time in the world to enjoy it? You understand what you're asking of me? Jonathan shrugged. I am asking you to bend the rules or watch me break them. Death threw his hands in the air in defeat. Fine, I'll make you a model. Jonathan looked confused for a second. What? No, I mean my dog, Rufus. The small corgi started to lick his master's face at the mention of his name. Death wanted to protest. The human was risking some total of the universe to make his dog mortal. Then he remembered all the souls that he had reaped, how many had asked about their pets as the day drifted to the afterlife, how many had willingly died trying to save them and kept quiet. Very well, that is acceptable. Jonathan flipped the switch and death was no longer in a bubble of probability. He then picked up Rufus and looked him in the eye. You hear that, Rufus. You're going to live forever and ever. I'll leave everything in your name, and you'll live like a king for all of time. Rufus put Jonathan, not hard, but hard enough that he dropped him. W w what's wrong, buddy? Rufus began to bark at death, who nodded in understanding. He does not want to live forever, not without you. Jonathan grabbed the little dog and hugged him as he began to cry. You can... Can you make it so that he lives as long as I do then? That is not a problem, but how can I be certain no one is going to try and do this again? Death pointed to the impossible room. It cost me 1.43 trillion credits and won't last past today. The core concept was created by the criminally insane genius who died after finishing the project. And besides... I doubt that you would fall for the same trick twice. Death grinned as only he could, bowed to the man who'd bested him and left. Jonathan Fry lived to be 213 years old, 
always accompanied with a small corgi named Rufus, which he insisted was a clone of a clone of his childhood pet. When asked why he'd built the impossible room, what had possessed him to spend half of his fortune on that project? Journalists recorded that his answer had been, I did it for my god, but only death and a very, very long-lived corgi knew the truth. And the last word was a typo. End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joe Kambaka. 